If you are a softball or baseball player and you want more power, faster bat speed, and higher exit velocity, Swing Dynamics is the program for you. Rob Cruz has just released his Swing Dynamics Bat Speed Training Program. The system comes with four custom pro maple bats, online training videos, a mobile app, pregame, preseason, and off-season bat speed programs, and more. To learn more about Swing Dynamics, log on to www.complete.game. That's www.complete.game. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Transcending Sport Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Cruz. My guest is Brent Eads. He is the founder, CEO of Line Drive Media. He has done so much in the softball community with regards to telling the stories of our players from youth to the professional to the Olympics. Brent, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Glad to have you. So um, I want—I want to, you know, you're, you're an interesting guy. We've known each other for years, but I, I, I've never seen anything out there that where you're telling your story. Like who or who's who is Brent Eads? Like who who the heck is this guy? <laughs> I don't know if you really want to know. <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if you're, uh, you know. I, I, and, and so what I what I like to do is um is start. Take, take us back to, to where you're from. Where, 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 where are you from? I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. And then for most of my pre-college years, I was in a little town north of Columbus, about 25 miles, called Delaware, Ohio. So I grew up on a five-acre farm. We had a barn, but I didn't go down there much. I was inside watching sports or reading comics or something. But... Um, no, it's, I had a great upbringing. I, I was adopted. I'm adopted. And uh, wonderful parents. And I have an older brother, 11 years older than me. And that's thus my parents thought they couldn't have any more children. They adopted me. And then the old story where a year and a half later, my younger brother was born. So, so I'm one of three boys. So that, I say that's why I don't know women very well. Because I, <laughs> I, I didn't have any sisters. <laughs> so I just had brothers. So, I, don't uh, anybody, I don't think anybody knows women very well. <laughs> you started going with it. So, I have daughters, and I, I, you know, I'm very happy now, and it's good to, good to be in the sport I love and with people I love. That's good. So, 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 tell me a little bit about what was it like in in, in what was it like at home in, in the early in the early days? What was that like in your home? Um, very peaceful. Uh, and again, like I said, five acre farm, this is pre-internet, pre-cell phone. You know, we were excited to have three channels, ABC, NBC, CBS, and once in a while Fox. So, you know, that was, that was huge. Um, but like I said, I, I did a lot of reading. I love to read. I always liked that side. I also have a strong music background. A lot of people okay. don't know that I got a bachelor of arts in music in college. Oh, you know, wow. Like, yeah, I actually, <laughs> it's going to sound strange for people to know me through softball, but I got an organ scholarship to college. Uh, and I've been in bands and played synthesizers and piano and organ and that kind of thing. So that was my background. I actually uh, got a Bachelor of Arts and I was set up to go to L.A. and intern for Chrysalis Records, a record company. And I thought I wanted to be in the music industry. And I was young and dumb and I showed up in L.A., and called the company and they go, well, this guy's left and there's no internship now. So what I ended up doing, I, my undergrad was at BYU. I got my master's at Loyola Marymount. And I was fortunate to receive the, a fellowship that they had just created. So it covered my education. But what's interesting is, if you know your basketball history, mm-hmm. I was there the year that Hank Gathers and Bo Kimball were lighting it up. I remember that. Yeah, in fact, um, Yes, if you know your history, you know that yeah. Hank Gathers passed away, died yeah. on the court. I remember that. And I wasn't at that game, but a couple of days later, ESPN did a, a showing of it, and they showed I, – I was in the crowd. And I'm like, oh, I wasn't wow. – they're making it – they made it look like he collapsed on the court, and then they showed the crowd all stunned and quiet. Well, that was at the memorial. It wasn't at the game, and I know wow. that because – I was at the memorial, but I wasn't at the game. So that's my college experience. And uh, what happened was in this this fellowship, what I did is I wrote business cases for Loyola Marymount, and they would go to 
They would send them out to other universities so they would be published in textbooks. My, my master's um, thesis was on sports, sports impact. And, and I ended up quoting a guy in it uh, who was big at the time. He did Cal High Sports, and he started a company called Student Sports, mm-hmm. Andy Bark. Andy Bark played football at Cal. And I, I quoted him in my master's thesis and sent him a copy. And he called me in, and I ended up being hired. And I remember at the time, my then wife wasn't happy because MBAs usually started out with about seventy, eighty thousand dollars, and I started for like twenty-four thousand. So <laughs> my MBA didn't make me rich, but it got me into the field I loved, and I've been there ever since. And student sports is where I got introduced to softball. So that's a whole so that, other. That's story. good. So, so let, let's go back. I, I want to walk through this. I want to take my time walking through this because, okay. well, first I want to say. It's funny how, and I'm a history person. <clears throat> Most people don't know I majored in history. Um, love history. I love to read. I still, to this day, there's books everywhere. Um, but it's funny how the media can paint a picture mm-hmm. of what, and tell the story of what happened. And then generations and generations will tell that same story based on what the media showed them. Exactly. But the people yeah. who were actually there... <laughs> have a whole nother story. So what I like to do is when I'm when I'm studying, especially recent recent history, is I like to ask the people who were there. Right. Hey, right. what was it? What was what was in the newspapers? <clears throat> excuse me, during that time. What 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 was what actually was how'd you feel about that? Like were do you know people that were there? Were you there? Where were you when this happened? I like to I like to talk to the, the people that are a little <clears throat> older that was that, that can tell me. Okay. So, so you see that video that you saw that, that clip that went viral? Yeah. That's actually not what happened. <laughs> but here is, is what happened. Yeah. yeah. You know? And I know that. I, I hesitate to say this because it sounds like I'm joking, but I'm not. The reason I wasn't at the game mm-hmm. is my family, uh, my wife's family, again, at the time, we were on Family Feud. I kid you not. We were on the Family Seriously? Feud. Yeah. <laughs> it, wow, that's cool. It, it, it's a sore subject because we were ahead 222 to nothing. We won two ga- or three games, and then the other family beat us. They, they won the last two games. Wow, so that's, that's, that's crazy. So let, let me, yeah. let's go back. Can we go back to, to, to music? Uh, who, who, was, who was your who, – how did you get – what influenced you to get into music? Um, as I said, I had an older brother, 11 years older than me, yeah. and my parents had in the home in Oregon like a Hammond organ. And so I was always kind of fascinated. My older brother wasn't interested, but I grew up and, and loved music. And, and, you know, it's funny. I always thought, what is the parallel between music and soft, or softball sports? Why do I like And And I thought that maybe this is a, a misguided theory, but in sports and music, you, you get immediate feedback, right? If you play well, people will cheer. They'll like you. They feel it. They feel the music. Sports, you get immediate result. You win, lose, that kind of thing. Right. So music was my first love, and I was exposed to the Beatles and others, 60 bands, my older brother. So I'm still to this day a Beatles fanatic, but I love music of all kinds. So I grew up with music and sports, and my sports career wasn't very esteemed. I always said I had the vertical jump of a table. <laughs> you know, they, they had to measure my speed with a sundial. Um, but I love sports and music, and so I always wanted to be in one of those two. So th- how I got into music was there was this organ. I would tinker around on it, play on it, and eventually I took lessons. And then I, like I said, I expanded into other keyboards and ended up playing trumpet in high school, harmonica and drums, and just kind of picked it all up. So, so, uh, so fun fact, I'm a drummer, played in oh, jazz nice. bands. Yeah. My dad yeah. is a jazz musician currently. He plays That's all awesome. woodwinds. My entire family is all musicians. That's also fantastic. Singing, uh, we, it, growing up in my house, I had tuba, harp, xylophone, tuba. basses, saxophone, alto sax, soprano sax. Um, but I gravitated to drums. I guess I just feel like I wanted to hit something. I actually just <laughs> recently bought a new, a brand new keyboard. <laughs> recently, <laughs> just just to kind of just to kind of like just fool around and just kind of just something to do, something different. To get kind of get back into uh, in, in my music, and but I, I, right now I'm loving. I, I love hip hop. I love jazz. I love uh, yeah. Latin music, merengue, salsa. Uh, yep. So I'm I'm I'm, in, I'm into that. So I, I I totally can relate to the, the music sports thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I one of my regrets in life is I didn't learn the guitar. I was too impatient. 
So I became pretty good on the bass because you play one note at a time. Yeah. And I was, I was in a college group that um, we toured England, Ireland, Scotland. Uh, it was it was a singing show group. It was through the university, but yeah, I got I played bass and it was fun to stand up and <laughs> when I was in bands, keyboard you're kind of stuck behind the keyboard, but playing bass and you know, I got to move around. So yeah, music was my first love, and I thought I was going to go into music, but fortunately, fate dictated otherwise, and I got into sports and um, I was with this company, Student Sports, and. What was fun about it is they, it was high school sports. Yeah. And I always tell people I got to interview when they were in high school, Tom Brady, LeBron James, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other athletes that went on to the pros. Um, and so that's where I first got into media. Uh, and I ended up over time publishing a magazine. That's where I did the interviews with these mm -hmm. guys. And then this thing came along called the internet. I don't know if you've heard of it. Okay. Online. Changed everything. So, yeah, when it's so, eventually the magazine went away and everything became online. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I got into softball. Andy Bart called me in one day and said, Brent, Nike wants to give us $350,000 to do initiatives in baseball, softball, and soccer. And student sports didn't have a softball site. We had a baseball and a soccer site. And Andy said, I want you to go start a softball site. And I don't, I don't know anything about softball. Mm -hmm. He said, well, and he said in a nice way, well, I don't care. <laughs> Go out and learn softball. And that's how I got into softball. And the very first thing I did, I knew some people at UCLA, Michael Sondheimer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went up and said, Michael, help me. I, I don't know anything about softball at this, this, I don't know, 20 years ago. And he said, I'm going to give you five names. I want you to go talk to these people. And it was Sue Inquist, yeah, who was the yeah. coach at UCLA. Puppy, who was her assistant. Mm -hmm. Mike Candrea, and then two club coaches, Gary Hanning and Tony Rico. Wow. <laughs> those names. Oh, stop. <laughs> those, the thing. So those names, let me just say something right now. Because okay. what year was this? Oh, I have no idea. Um, no idea. Yeah, Let's yeah. just say, argument say 20 years ago. Okay, so. so true story. Okay. Once upon a time, this was about probably, oh, maybe... Eight or seven, I'm thinking, but I'm guessing. But okay. I, th I think I'm right, but I'm, but I'm guessing. Um, this is when I first actually met Sue and Quest for the first time. Mm -hmm. And one of my players, a New York kid by the name of Maddie Coon, she ended up going yeah. to play at Stanford. She, she, was, she, was, she was big time. She's probably, if not the best hitter I've ever coached, one of them. Yeah, I she covered hit, her. She hit third as, as a freshman at Stanford under John yeah. Rittman. And coming from New York, like that just doesn't happen, especially at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, Puppy, though, come to find out, Puppy, the, the, the assistant at, at uh, UCLA at the time, right. was from my hometown. That's cool. Of New Rochelle, New York. She, went to, she was from the, like, the Feeney Park side of New Rochelle, or the South Side Park. Um, and I'm like, this is crazy. So this was back when they did home visits. Yeah, yeah, right. So UCLA f coaching staff flew to New York to do a home visit. Okay. And they came to Maddie's house. They came to her lesson. And, you know, it was, it was, it was the, 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 the recruiting landscape was way different back then. It was actually her senior fall. She had not committed yet. It was, it was just a whole different. Can you imagine yes, like, allowing a kid to literally fully blossom and develop? And then recruit? And then so it was like, it was, it was like, she ended up, she ended up, she ended up, um, um, going to Stanford and not UCLA, but that's mm -hmm. that's another story. But yeah, but that that so when I see these names, it just reminds me of, and then I see Candrea and the things that that Mike Candrea has has contributed, and, and how the things that Arizona has contributed to the game of softball, as well as UCLA. I mean, as well as UCLA. Um, and and then um, Gary Hanning, legendary. Yeah, Tony Rico, legendary. Mm -hmm. These people changed development. They, they, these people were the epitome of player development at a time where the game was still small. Right. You know? So, yeah, those names. Whew. Well, here's, and here's what blew me away. And by the way, doing my math, I think this was probably 30, maybe 35 years ago. It's not 20. Oh, wow. I, I, yeah, I wish it was. But what blew me away is I'd been in the, the, ba the football and men's basketball where, it, I mean, there's like five levels to get to a coach, college coach, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so I was able to set up meetings with all five of these people. And they welcomed me with open arms. Mm -hmm. I mean, Stu Inquist is one of the most bubbly, infectious people you ever meet. Um, but they, they let, sat down with me and I don't know, gave me 30 minutes, an hour and talked to me, talked to me about softball. And I was a nobody. They didn't know me from Adam, but they gave me the time. And I remember sitting in Mike Kendrea's office, Arizona office, and looking around thinking, this is, this was like the Olympics were just coming in softball. I think it was like six months before. I want to say the first one, don't quote me on that, where softball returned or started, but I remember I'm I'm sitting here across like I am you now, only in person, from Mike Kendrea, and I'm thinking, this is the freaking USA Olympic softball head coach, and who am I? But I'm sitting in his office, and he's talking about the sport and what works and what doesn't work, and just off Gary and, and Tony Rico, I remember meetings because I hadn't been received as a media person, journalist, so openly and warmly. Mm -hmm. And I saw that these five people were interested in building the sport. They were interested. And, um, you know, the sport was very undercovered at that time. Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely. still is in some ways, but. In, in a lot of ways. And, and I want to get into, so, so a couple things. Some things that we're, okay. we're naturally organically coming up in conversation with us are okay. actually things that I have written down. Okay. Maybe not in the I'm same not... order. <laughs> Maybe not in the same order that I, th that I thought I wanted to do, but that's the wonderful thing about having a conversation. Is that yeah. things organically happen, and one one string of, of conversation can lead to another. Uh, but back back then, so I want to talk about Arizona under my, under, okay. under the leadership of Mike Andrea, UCLA under the leadership of Sue Inquest, and then the tra tra transfer of the or the handing of the baton to Kelly Andrea Perez, who you know, and, and Lisa Fernandez. Those those two are like, oh gosh. So, but I want to say. It seems like there's a shift, or there has been a shift, and I never thought that I would see the day where softball would be so heavy on the other side of the country, when right. it used to be so much more heavier on the on the West Coast. And to me personally, West Coast softball is still still if not the mecca it is a mecca in, mm -hmm. a, in a lot of ways because of the way the game is played mm -hmm. particularly defense like if you right. want to see great defense oh it's always been that way mm -hmm. like fundamentally sound people aren't making mistakes and, and you've been embedded in the west coast you've been embedded in, in that so you, you, you you've experienced it Right, and then we we also seeing how the game has changed. And you go watch a game now, and defense is not something that is. I feel like people are not taking defense as seriously, or taking as much pride in it in defense, like they used to. And I'd agree. Errors, it's errors on easy plays are are, far, are happening far too often. What do you think? And, and I have my own theories, but I'm I'm, I'm curious to know. Have you have you paid attention to that? Are you seeing that in the details of the game when you watch uh, in today's modern softball game? Yeah, I think it's it's like any sport, the offense and you know that home runs bring in the the big bucks and baseball and football, it's quarterbacks and so I think offense sometimes is it, it grabs the attention, the big plays, whatever sport it's in, the big slam dunk. But I think de as they always say, defense wins games, and you know it can come down to one crucial error that's going to cost you a game. So I think a lot of it is, you know, it's very, obviously our sport is very pitching dominated and now you've got the hitters, you know, like a Jocelyn Allo, she, you know, she can take over a game with her yeah. power. So, but I, I agree. I think it's a subtlety. Defense is one of those things. It's not flashy. It's just important that wins you game. So I would agree with that. I, I go out and watch and, you know, it's fun to watch middle infielders who I grew up on baseball and, and watching smooth six four three plays and, and how that works, but um, yeah, I, I don't see it as emphasized as much as I it sounds like you think it should be. Yeah, and, I, and I, what I have noticed is that I don't know if you, I don't know if you've seen this, but a lot more double plays have been uh, have been and are being turned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think the University of South Carolina, although their record does not reflect how great their defense is, they may be one or two in the country in defense. Yeah. 
but they actually turned four double plays in a game twice this season already. That's, <laughs> but what, I, what I've also noticed is that the arms, the arm strength uh, yes. for a second baseman now, like you got arms all over the infield now. Now you got shortstops at first base with shortstop arms and third base arms. So throwing right. harder, you know, um, is, is contributing to the, to people's ability to, to turn more goal play. So one more. So now off that and going kind of into something else you brought up, um, I wanted to talk about, because I want to go back a little bit because I want to go into some other things, but I want to go back okay. to find out growing up who were, who was, or who were some of your, your biggest influences. Did you have any, uh, like little like heroes growing up, you know, the, the I, people that you looked up to, and I don't know. I'm I'm so old. I don't know if you'll know these names or remember them. But I grew up a huge Ohio State football fan. Okay, uh, this was back in the era of Woody Hayes, and you know, the Buckeyes were one of the top programs. And I was a little kid. I've never really said this to anybody, but if they would lose, like they lost the Rose Bowl a couple times, I would cry. I once taped on a tape recorder. I was going to make my prized possession at Rose Bowl, Ohio State. I think they were undefeated at the time. This is in the 70s. And they lost the, the Rose Bowl. And you can hear this little five, six, seven-year-old sobbing, sobbing about that loss. So I grew up a huge sports fan, but, you know, locally. I was an Ohio State fan. And also one of my, my heroes was um, Archie Griffin, two-time Heisman Trophy winner. And just I had a chance to meet him, and he was just classy. And again, I'm a young kid, and... These are my heroes, and I see them on TV, and they're bigger than life. So those were kind of my sports childhood heroes, and I was also a huge Cincinnati Reds fan. I can still tell you the starting lineup from the 74, 75, 76 Reds. You know, it can had, I tell you something? <laughs> it's funny you say I, I, I almost didn't even put, put it together that Cincinnati was in Ohio to just now. I mean, I forgot that, <laughs> that Cincinnati was in Ohio. Yeah. Um, but Eric Davis... Oh, love Derek Davis. Yes, was and I didn't get to see because you know back when I grew up, baseball wasn't you know you didn't have immediate access like to to, to like highlights and get, you didn't even get to see what people look players look like, right? Other than mm-hmm. other than my baseball cards, sure. Like I, I'd have to go through my baseball cards just to kind of remind myself, oh, this is what these different players are looking like, right? So, mm-hmm. and then there were a couple of shows that came on TV like baseball. Uh, uh, was it uh, This Week in Baseball? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And This Week in Baseball came on on Saturdays, and it would show, you, you would get to see all the teams. And growing up in New York, I only got to see the Yankees and the Mets on TV. Yeah. Or, or who they were playing against. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? So it was like, to be able to say, oh, oh, yeah, Ricky Henderson, yeah, you know, you know Oakland. Uh, you know, you get to see the players, they're all, they're, Pete Rose, you know, obviously Cincinnati Reds, Pete Rose, how could you not, how could you not? But, Growing up watching Eric Davis, for me, and he was not on the New York team. I mean, the New York, the Yankees were not good, you know, during that mm-hmm. time. Um, but like, Eric Davis was the kind of player that I always wanted to be, yeah. and be like, speed, the rare combination of speed and power. Mm-hmm. To this day, Correct. it's still really hard to find that rare combination of speed and power. To this day, mm-hmm. in both baseball and softball, it's and a great defense. I remember him jumping oh, over the fence and, oh, and you know, seeing home runs. So, oh, yeah. yeah. And that, too. And he'd rob home runs and throw people out. I mean, he was just that was guy. Five tool dude. Oh, yeah. And I, people watching this, if you're too young to remember Eric Davis, go do a, a Google oh, search or a YouTube this guy search. Was Eric incredible. Davis. Smooth. Just smooth. He was incredible. So, I had, yeah. it's funny because I've, I've read Daryl Strawberry's mm-hmm. autobiography years ago. Mm-hmm. And and I, and I got to realize that Daryl Strawberry and Eric Davis both played at the same high school. That's that? right. I remembered. I hadn't remembered yeah, they, it. They played at the same high school. So Daryl yeah. Daryl was telling stories about how they would have like 20, 24 scouts, twenty five scouts at a high school practice. <laughs> Just camped. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. Gotten, like scouts camped out at practice in chairs, just kind of hanging out at practice. Hey, we're just, we're just gonna watch some practice. I, th- I think Imagine. Chris Brown. I think Chris Brown was in that loop somewhere in that yep. same, coming from that same area. Yeah. So that those were those were it was just different back then, a little different. Um, it was in LA, right? I can't remember. Yeah, they were, they were in Southern California, absolutely. They were Southern California. Yeah. I can't remember what high school it was, but uh, imagine being that high school baseball coach. Like if you lost, 
Like it's not the player's yeah. fault. No, 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 no. You, <laughs> you, can't, you can't lose. Got those two guys. Got those two guys. So, okay. so fast forward, you 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 break into the softball space, and you, you, so how'd you fall in love with softball? What was the was there a moment that said, "Man, softball"? Because it could have been. It didn't have to be softball. Why softball? How softball? Mm-hmm. Well, I started covering it editorially, and I had done other things. I'd done a print magazine. I'd been there for the start of the internet. Um, I had worked with a company. Our company worked with Rivals, if you remember them, they, yeah. 24-7. These are more football, basketball recruiting companies. Mm-hmm. And so what I ended up doing is taking what I learned on the, on the boys and men's side over to softball. And one of the things I've become known for, as you probably know, is player rankings. Mm-hmm. And I did those just simply because they worked on the boys' side, you know, the mm-hmm. football rankings. And so Rivals and 24-7 and uh, Blue Chip, these are all companies I knew from the football side. And so on that recruiting front, I just brought it over. But to answer your question, when I fell in love with it was when I met these five early people and they were so open and accommodating. And then I started to cover the sport on a daily basis and got to know the people and the players. And and I don't want this to sound sexist, but boys are very focused on their game and getting better. The girls are focused on everything, getting better, being good people be an articulate education. And unfortunately, we can talk more about this, but there's not really a viable pro league. They're not looking to be in the MLB draft. They're not looking to be a first rounder in NFL and make millions. Unfortunately, these girls are fortunately, I should say, are looking to get an education. So I loved the people, the coaches were accommodating. It was just a more open, friendly sport than I had known covering, especially on the boys' side. I agree. Yeah. yeah, and I when I, I what I fell in love with the game is, and I and I say this, being I'm very honest, I can't watch baseball anymore. It's too slow. I can't either. I can't watch. A guy will step out of the box. He'll get the sign. He'll adjust his hat and scratch himself. And it's just. I thought it takes I was the only. I thought I was the only one. I thought something was wrong with me. I cannot do it. I can't even. I don't. I cannot watch a baseball game. I can't. And I told you I was a big Reds fan. I could literally tell you, Ken Griffey and Joe Morgan and Tony Perez and Johnny Bench and on and on and on. I can't tell you one player in the Reds team. That was my team because I don't follow it because after watching softball, 90 feet, you know, it's 60 feet, the mound, 44, and, you know, all of this, it's, it's fast. It's a fast moving game. And if you, and I don't know if you agree with it. When I grew up, there was a thing called a drag bunt but it wasn't as prevalent as slapping is today. So you have these girls, you put them left side and they bounce the ball and it's going to be a contest. Can this great strong arm shortstop gun out this person that runs a two five down? It's just a different game, but I love it more than baseball. So let me tell you you something about that drag one thing. So Mm -hmm. I remember when I, when I first began to start to do research in softball, I started researching it because Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to uh, understand it better. I had been teaching hitting and girls were going out having success, but I still hadn't really seen the game being played. Right. Right. So yeah. I, I, I went to a tournament that was in Jersey. Shout out to Jim Barcelona. It was, mm-hmm. it was called Team New Jersey. Oh, yeah, sure. And, and one of my, a couple of my kids were playing for a team called the Virginia Shamrocks. I know them. Know now, the back yeah. then, it, there was this thing called gold. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right? But you mm-hmm. can only be a gold team if you have qualified for the gold nationals. Right. Which USA at that time was the, ASA, was the ASA gold nationals. Well, I didn't know all this. So I'm, I'm going yeah. to, the, to the game, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go watch some girls softball. I brought my camera. I'm like a tourist. And I'm like, right, I just want to see what's going on here. <laughs> Because people are saying that my hitters are having success, um, and I and I'm, I'm not surprised. This is early in my. This is when I first started to convert over to softball. So I'm at the field, and and the Shamrocks were playing against a team called <clears throat> Georgia Elite. Okay. I don't even think that they even exist anymore. But from what I've been told, they were they were the freaking real deal. Okay, I don't doubt it. <laughs> like this is what I this is what I've been told. 
So yeah. these girls get up. So first of all, girls are laying out, full extension, diving in the outfield, making phenomenal mm-hmm. catches on both teams. Okay. And then I saw someone slap for the first time. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I couldn't even believe it. I was like, this is great. This is, this is different. Yeah. And I think at that moment, you know, at that, I, I remember it's like, like it was yesterday. At that moment, I was so intrigued by the entire mm-hmm. game of fast pitch softball. And, and I became a student of it. And then I flew out to California. I went to the, the tournament in Cathedral City and out in, um, yeah. Out Cal- Cathedral that? City. Was it Oregon State or Oregon um, runs it? Yeah, what's that called? I've been to it. Uh, yeah, I, so I, I, I went out there because that's where all the best teams were, you know, in February. Yeah, yeah. right. And I went that's out there. Where I, that's yeah, where I, I first heard here too. That's how I got my exposure to softball in Cathedral City. What's that that's called? What I flew out and I said, I got I to gotta see, see the best. And that, that's how, that's how I started. That's the that's, that was the beginning of me kind of getting into the game. But yeah, it, it's it's and, and again, like you said, it's, it's hard for me. It's very difficult for me to 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 sit down and watch a baseball game knowing what I know, <clears throat> you know about about this game. It's funny. I, I went to I went to Yankee Stadium a couple of weeks ago, and I don't mm-hmm. even to be honest with you. I mean, we had like uh, club passes. Okay. I think I might have went out to actually watch the actual game. <laughs> You're in the club, end, just to say I went out there. I was not yeah. interested in watching the game. It seems like it's three hour difference between seven innings and nine innings. <laughs> I, I, just, I, you know, I game so fast, like this hour and a half, hour forty five, and then mm-hmm. you watch a baseball game, and I think I've seen College World Series that was shorter in softball than some of these baseball games. So I just, it's tainted me it's polluted me that i i can't watch baseball anymore and I, it's a great sport and i don't mm-hmm. deny anybody that plays it i just after watching softball <clears throat> excuse me i'm just a softball guy now and love the sport love the people mm-hmm. and I, you know my thing i love is i get to meet the club coaches you mentioned jim barcelona or the, the tournament directors mm-hmm. uh, you know i had a situation where two years ago my mother passed away it was in january 22 and I, I um, put up a note on my site at the time saying, you know, I'm going back to Ohio. My mom's uh, in a, a you know, care facility and mm-hmm. I'm going to be gone. And I just wanted to let people know I was going to be out of touch for a week yeah. or so. The response I got, the love, I'm, I'm going to start crying. The love I got from the softball world really, really touched me. You know, people are saying you and your family are in my prayers. And, and I'm not saying this doesn't happen in other situations, but I realized that this group of people, this community in softball, they care. Yeah. They, not just about their kids, but they care about other people. Yeah. And, I, and again, not to knock the boys' side, but I've really never seen it. You know, everyone's out to do their own thing. But on the girls' side, people care. Yeah, there, and, there, is, a, there is a level of intimacy. Yeah, in the game of softball, and I think it's because of the feminine, the the, the, the female aspect of it. The yeah. girls, and we have we as, as it's like the, you have the daddy daughter relationships, you have the mom daughter relationships, you have the it's, it's a it's a it's a it's a love based um, sport, mm-hmm. and um, my condolences for, for your, and with your mom her passing, and yeah. how, what what let's talk, can we talk about your mom? What kind of person was she? Oh, dude. You want me to get balling on here? No, nah, you don't got a ball, but I'm, I'm interested to know. My dad was my hero, yeah. but my mom was my rock. And she was the kind of mom that, you know, she, my dad worked at General Motors all his life. Yeah. Columbus, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Okay. And I just remember coming home from school, walking in the house and smelling fresh baked cookies. Wow. And I blame that why I'm not a great athlete because she made me so many good desserts. <laughs> no, but I, but my mom was spiritual. She was, and I also how fortunate am I to say this? I don't remember my parents ever arguing, ever. So I had the and I didn't know it. I just think this is how family life is. And so my mom was just. She was the sweetest person I'd ever known. And to, her laugh, even to this day, I try to go back and watch old videos. Her laugh was just the most beautiful music I'd ever heard. So I was very blessed to have a wonderful upbringing and support of my parents. And 
What's funny is my mom wouldn't go to my sporting events. My dad would, but my mom would go to my music events and my dad wouldn't. So it's kind of like he never went to, you know, dad was a sports junkie. Mom was a music junkie. So and your dad was like, I'm not going, I'm not going yeah. to the concert. Jack, Jack, my dad, you go support him in baseball or football or whatever, basketball. Yeah. And she would support me in the school stuff or the you know, academic stuff or music stuff. So, so no, I, I had, and again, I was adopted. And yep. as I got older in life, I look, I started to look back and go, wow, how blessed was I to be adopted and raised by these fantastic people. And they, and my brothers and my parents never, ever brought up that I was adopted. You know, I, after the fact, I look back and my younger brother, when we were a little year and a half difference, he could have been a punk and said, you know, you're not part of this family or you weren't born and you know, never zero times. And I'm very close to my younger brother today. And, but uh, yeah, family. I, I had the most wonderful family. We had, you know, issues and situations and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I couldn't ask for a better childhood. Very, very That's blessed. Awesome. And I, I love my childhood too. I, I always, I always go back, and I have these memories of how phenomenal my. That, that's important. Like my, my childhood was so. My neighborhood was so amazing. Right. And, you know, and and being a part of of, of a community growing up is. is was was for me that was everything yeah and then still being able to be a part of a community in softball is everything to me also it reminds you know, me a, a lot of i'm a community person and i can sense that you're a community person and what you have done what you have contributed to the softball community ties us even closer together as a community because you play yeah. a very significant role mm, um, appreciate it um and and, and, and you're, you are a significant part of, of the softball community as well, like in, in terms of the development of our, our, our athletes and goal oriented, goal oriented, covering the stories that nobody would have maybe even pay attention to. And, um, and, and those are things that are important, which is why I really respect um, what you have been throughout the years. Thank you. It's been a wonderful, wonderful job for me. And I always go back and say what I do for a living people, you know, I work in sports media, they ask specifics, I work in softball coverage. But then if they get more wanting details, I say, I get to tell stories. Mm -hmm. I get, you know, I'm not interested in a game five, four, I'm not as interested. But when I can tell the story of this girl who's overcome odds or, you know, the, these people, the good, bad and ugly. Um, I, no, I don't focus on the ugly too much, but it's it's sharing these stories, the human interest stories. And that's what I love. And And I always tell people, you know, again, going back to the rankings. People take this probably much more serious than I think they should, but it's, I always go back to one word. The rankings are to honor the athlete. And it's important to note that I will never say anything critical of a kid. It's not a scouting report. I tell people I'm not a scout. I'm not recruiting service. And there's places for that. I'm a media outlet covering the sport, telling the Rob Cruz story, telling whatever story. And telling the, the you know the the dedication and the the motivation, the work ethic behind these kids or coaches or even parents, and that's what I love to do is tell stories and honor the sport. So the rankings were just something I saw that worked on the boys' side, and I thought I'll bring this in to honor the girls, and it's become very popular. And, and you know, I, I have I've literally had <clears throat> excuse me coaches call me and say, hey, I have two players sobbing because they didn't make the top one hundred. I'm like. This isn't what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be like, in the media side, I would compare it to Gatorade State Player of the Year, National Player of the Year. It's, a, it's an honor. It's a recognition. But it's not the all end all beat all. It's just, I, I always say, I hope these girls that are top 100 or whatever can someday tell their grandkids, look, grandma was pretty good and here's proof. I was ranked one of the top 50, one of the top 25, one of the top 200 players in my sport. Grandma was pretty darn good, and that's that's how I approach and, it. It's, and you, you know, know what? I want to I want to dig into that a little bit with with regards to the rankings, uh, okay. because the thing about rankings is, it's it's about it's about the perspective of the individual, mm -hmm. and how they view the rankings, right? But in turn, it's how they view themselves. Yeah, yeah. You understand? So when I look at any type of ranking. You know, what are the top five educational institutions in America? Sure. Top five business schools in America. That doesn't mean that the 10th business school 
is any worse than the number one business school because you still got to go into that business school and you still got to get it done. Right, right, right. Just because I go, just because I attend, I don't know if you understand where I'm going. So, so it, 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 it's a perspective on, on that, right? But the other part about rankings for me is, and, and I'd love for you to go into like, what does that entail? Like, what types of research resources um, okay. do, do you and your team go through? To are you ever going to get it right? Is it ever going to be? Is it ever going to be? Is everybody ever? Are you ever going to have a one hundred percent agreement no. on who's who should be two hundredth ranked or who should be ranked one hundred twenty five or who should be ranked eightieth? Right. I think what yeah. I think, and t- correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's so much easier to do the top ten. Yeah. Because the top ten, it's obvious. Nobody's nobody's arguing about top ten. Yes, they're top ten. But then yeah. when you start to get lower. There's a lot of different gray areas, and there's a lot of things that there's a lot of things that I would I would I would guess that as you go lower in the in the rankings, a one a player that's 100 could very have easily been 150, and a player mm-hmm. that's that's 150 could very easily have been 90. Absolutely. I mean, that's yeah. how I would I would imagine it. So, what do you think? Um, I tell people this is an inexact science. I mean, look at the NFL or MLB, NBA drafts. I mean, they'll, you know, they'll draft a number two quarterback and give him fifty million dollars, and he ends up not panning out. It's not a science. No. I, I heard about one time say, my job would be easy if, for two things, and this was a baseball scout. He said, if I could predict how the athlete will develop physically, and also if I could measure their heart. So we can't measure hearts. We can't measure, you know, I've, I've seen athletes, I'm sure you have, that are five tool, have all the skills in the world, and they just don't have the work ethic. Nope. And then you see a Pete Rose type who shouldn't be on this field, yet he hustles, Charlie Hustle, mm-hmm. and he busts his butt, and he becomes a Hall of Famer. So you can't measure the size of someone's heart. It's, and, you know, I've had top 100 kids that quit the sport because maybe they're so good as a track runner. Or, mm-hmm. But the thing I say about the rankings, and I start – when they're in the seventh grade. And a lot of people go, that's too young. And I go, you don't understand. This is a journey. I'm doing a story on a girl. Um, I'm doing it later today. She committed to Georgia. When she first came out, I had her ranked, I want to say in the eighties, she moved up to the fifties. And last year she was 13 and she'll probably be top five or 10 this year. Cause it's a journey. They improve. You know, and over time you start to see the work ethic and you start to see all this and how it comes out. And that's where I tell people, even if, you know, you're a senior and you're not in the top 100, so what? Prove me wrong. Go, go out and go. Yeah. yeah. I, because, I, because I was Because it, it really speaks to who you are, though, with how you view the rankings. Because mm-hmm. one of my kids came in and said, I was ranked, I forgot what she said, 100 and whatever. Mm-hmm. I was like, how do you feel about that? She's like, I'm freaking pissed. I was like, let's go then. And, that, and, that, and, and guess what? I love that. I do too. I because do too. That might be the reason why she 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 gets fired up. So it works in a lot of different ways. Because you could be, I invite, you could sorry, be a seventh Rob. grader, but you, you could be a seventh grader or an eighth grader. And somebody said that's too young, right? But as in seventh and eighth grader, you were in the top fifty, and then all of a sudden you're in tenth grade. What happened? You dropped yeah. down now. Because, because and what you, I you did that. You dropped down. Yeah. Or other girls worked harder and went up. You know, it's, it's a combination of both. But people go, why do you rank seventh graders? They're too young. And I go, you, do you realize they're gymnasts <laughs> and national that are 12 years old on the you know, Olympics and on national world, international TV? But also I'll say, do you realize that USA Softball does their HPP program, seventh grade? They start looking for these kids early who are going to be candidates for the national team. Yeah. There's nothing wrong. And, and here's how I always thought about it. These girls are playing club. They're going across the country to play other top players and club teams. Do you think that they're going to fold or they're going to not rise to the level because, oh, my gosh, we're putting pressure on them? This is a sport where you step in the box and it counts three and two with bases loaded and two outs. That's a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. Or if you're the pitcher, base loaded, three, two count, that's a lot of pressure. So I always kind of get a little, excuse my language, pissed off. It's like, why are you babying these kids? They're doing something they love. It's so here, here, 
So you're, you're, you're going right. Petition because there's a winner and a loser. And that's yeah. part of the game. So you're going right down the alley, though, that I wanted to go down. And, um, and it, it becomes this. And I have this, I have this written down as a question. Okay. What can we learn at what women's basketball at the collegiate level and even the AAU competitive travel level? Mm -hmm. What can softball learn? And we, we talked a little bit about it the other day. Mm -hmm. uh, I brought it up. And I've been bringing it up to get a perspective from people that I respect. Because until we, as a sport, as an industry, softball, because we want our kids to have a viable pro league. You brought that up earlier in today's conversation. We want right. them to have a viable pro league. And we want them to have these uh, economic opportunities at a professional level post-college. I, I mm -hmm. think we really do. Mm -hmm. Yet we, when I watch how the sport is covered, particularly with ESPN analysts, mm -hmm. um, not even holding the kids accountable to, to easy errors. Mm -hmm. And this is not every announcer, but most of them. Not holding them accountable to ball balls that can, that can be caught. Because we have to be, understand that if a brand, a company, is going, to, is going to buy into or support a sport, it's going to be because that sport has the eyeballs. Exactly. Exactly. And what makes, what makes eyeballs drawn to a sport are the stories being told. 100% right. And that's how it works. That's how branding and marketing works. You mentioned women's basketball. When you think college women's basketball, what name comes in your mind this year? Well, I think of a, a lot of different names, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but from the media standpoint, from, from, from the captain, Caitlin Clark. Okay. It's, 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 yeah, Caitlin Clark. You watch video of her. She's shooting like three-pointers from the three-point line almost halfway to the, almost the half point. Point. Every time she shoots it and one goes, out, I, I jump out of my seat like, because <gasps> that because we know why? That's exciting. That's yeah. entertaining. The fact that and she it, can shoot a ball that well... That's entertaining and that's exciting. And guess what? I'm watching it. Yes. I couldn't stop watching it. It's eyeballs. And why is it an eyeball? Because she becomes a personality. She becomes, she's not just another basketball player. She becomes a figure in the sport. You know, um, I remember in college basketball, Jimmer Fredette at BYU. He was, he was shooting three-pointers that were you know, 12 feet behind the line. And no, nobody can do that. So if someone is a great track runner or you know, Carl Lewis type, they become personalities. And when I got into softball, they were fantastic. And I worked with Amanda Freed. And I've known a lot of these Olympians. And I was looking through an email, um, just other people's that I'm going, wow, she was Olympian. You know, this, this, she's a, a broadcaster. But they didn't, at their time, necessarily become a personality that the national public, international public, let alone the college world or, or whatever, could, could identify with. Right. They, they didn't Here's become... The identify with. Here's What's the that? I can identify with. Because I, I'm, I'm going to quote someone, but I'm not going to say her name. But she's, okay. she's softball royalty. Okay. And she said to me, softball has plenty of Caitlin Clarks. But we need more Angel Reese's in softball. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was yeah. profound, especially coming from her. But I, I would expect that from her. Former yeah. All-American, former professional softball player. Um, and, and because of the... She's interesting. Right, right. Or she's doing something that what, what very... College, what college basketball player makes her announcement in Vogue magazine? Caitlin Clark is, is getting major sponsorship deals. It's not back companies and cleat companies and glove companies and back gadget companies. Yeah. It's insurance companies mm -hmm. like Gatorade. <laughs> like that's the, that, those are major brand opportunities and collaborations and partnerships. So for me, right. I, and I'm looking at it like, 
we have to be more authentic in softball. We have to tell the stories of our players a little bit better. Yes. The good, mm-hmm. the bad, and the ugly. Mm-hmm. Because it's relatable. And when it's relatable, we, that every little girl in the country, even us as grown men, can connect and identify with a player. And, and you get interested in it. You follow them on social media. And, you, and, 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 and I think I was talking to somebody who played AAU basketball. Um, mm-hmm. She also played softball. One of my students. I said, "Why is why is why is basketball player? Why are they? Why is are you guys so brand conscious? It's like a swag fest." <laughs> and she, and she, 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 it's like it's a swag fest. And she said to me, "She said, well, my AAU team, we had to take financial literacy classes and marketing and branding classes. That's awesome. In AAU basketball, yeah, because we have to know how to brand ourselves mm-hmm. because some of the high school kids and some of the teams are are, are sponsored by major brands." And we have to understand that we're a brand and we're actually collaborating with those brands. So they have yeah. these relationships with these corporate brands in like seventh grade. To your point, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade. So when they get to college, they understand how it all works. They become personalities and they can become personalities at a very young age. I and mean, it wasn't that long ago where two seventh graders committed to Florida and then next year a sixth grader committed. I remember that. If anything, that brings attention and some would say it's not good and these are kids but i'm going to segue into something i feel strongly it might be a little controversial i think sometimes i've seen it that softball players are kind of babied and treated like well you're a girl you can't be tough or you're a girl and i'm like i i had three daughters my first three kids were three daughters and i was like screw that these are people athletes they work harder many times more than the boys Let's give them their due. Let's tell their stories. Let's honor them. I did a story this week. Um, I just did it yesterday on a girl in Pennsylvania. She's a high school senior. She hit the thousand strikeout mark, thousand strikeouts, and she still has like 18, 20 games left. She'll probably end up end up her career with finish with 1,200 strikeouts. Mm-hmm. Fantastic story. And, and the local Pennsylvania papers did something. But why isn't that a national story? She's the fourth, only the fourth player in Pennsylvania softball history to hit a thousand strikeouts, and she's going to Fordham. Mm-hmm. She's number five, but this is a great, great story. Why are yeah, why are right. these not being told? And we're we're not building the personalities. We're not telling the great stories. And let me tell you some. Uh, this this happened a year and a half, two years ago. Um, a, and I don't want to get into details, but there was a situation where college softball player, former college softball player at a a very well-known school, um, got arrested. And it was in the the major paper where she lived. And we did a story just kind of highlighting that, telling the story. Now, this was in a major paper. Her mugshot was included, the details, the arrest. And so we ran it, good, bad, and ugly. We're telling this situation. You would not believe the flack that we got why are you doing this? This isn't building up the sport. This isn't a positive thing. And I'm like, because it's public information. It's not like we're going into someone's home and putting, you know, a stethoscope up to hear the conversations. We are reporting something that's out there. And it's the ugly side. And it is humanity. I mean. And can I say this? To, and I, I 100% agree with you. 100%. And this is the reason why softball is less... Um, validated it, it's less um, less interesting because mm-hmm. we are trying to protect it and keep it like this pure perfect thing right right and people want to see the subplots yeah you can learn from you can learn for first of all everybody can make anybody can make a mistake mm-hmm. right so she's human yeah. Anybody can recover from that mistake. She's human. We can still support her and love her, even though she made a mistake. Yeah. Because we're humans. That's why it's community. But if if we continue to allow the the narrative to be that softball is this pristine, perfect sport, and you can't flip your back, and you can't be yourself, and you can't look at what they're not even letting the guys flip the bats in college anymore. Mm-hmm. Really? This is exactly why baseball is boring. You take away the humanity, the personalities, the interesting exactly facts. Why. 
and it's sterilized. It's like, yeah. it almost seems like it's, what was it, the World Wrestling Federation where it's scripted. And no, I, I think about this, you know, again, I come from an arts background. Yeah. When you tell, go to a play or usually movies, the first act is they set up who the people are. The second act is there's a conflict, there's, there's a struggle, there's the obstacle. And then the last act is usually resolving that. How does the person overcome the trials or tribulations? And to me, that's, that's what's interesting. I've done stories on, on girls that almost died from cancer, and now they're back on the field winning, and not just winning in softball, winning in life. That's, that's a dramatic story. Let's tell those stories. But, but when an athlete struggles, let's, let's tell the story in, in a respectful way, not, you know, so-and-so was arrested, but let's, let's treat it respectfully. But if there's something that, you know, happens that gives the sport a black eye, then let's recognize that. We not, have to tell not, it. We have to tell it. It's, it's called telling the truth. And I, I was surprised that people in softball, they, they don't want the unpleasant at least from a media standpoint. They don't. They, no, you're right. They, you're right. They just the happy. And that's part of life. And that's great. And I love celebrating that. But sometimes we get, you know, a team loses. There are teams that come and in what second. What happens is it doesn't become relatable. Right. And it's hard right. to have a sport take off to get the national coverage. Yeah. When it's not relatable. Because who wants to watch something that's not relatable? And then because it's not human, you don't have the personalities, you don't have the drama, you know, overcoming obstacles and all that. Then yeah. it's it's boring, and, and hope, hopefully we can we can grow to a place as a sport. It's only going to benefit the next generation of softball players. Yeah, you know, and, and it's because I, I like for, for me it's the it's the trash talk. Okay, and here's the deal: like you 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 mentioned um, something about you said this you said this might be controversial, but I don't think it's controversial. You said that um, we uh, we don't think that girls can be tough. We're not we're not we're not teaching our girl, we're not teaching our young girls. And it's okay to be tough. It doesn't yeah, take away from, it doesn't take protected. away from it doesn't take away from who you are as a person because you can be tough. So mm-hmm. and I'll give you an example. And, and this is this is an American culture thing. Mm-hmm. Because American culture marginalizes women in a lot of ways. It's a part of American culture. It's not even a thing where we can even say that we consciously do it or not. We consciously aware of it. Whether we consciously are conscious of it or unconscious, we're culturally conditioned mm-hmm. to marginalize women that's a fact yeah so when a, uh when i'm doing a camp or a clinic and i ask a question in softball hey raise your hand if you're fast and all the girls look around to see who's going to raise their hand huh, and, interesting. right even the fast yeah. ones even the ones who yeah. are fast won't raise their hand but if we I don't want to if, if anybody I ask that same question if i ask that same question to a bunch of baseball players the slowest dude <laughs> It's going to be like, I'm fast. <laughs> Dude, you're <Yeah>. fast. <laughs> but you know yeah. what I mean? Like, so we have to, uh, and, and for me, that's important. For me, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm working with my, with my girls, I'm trying to transfer that inner confidence to let them know it is okay to know that you are good. It is okay to be a little bit cocky. It is okay to be a little bit confident. It doesn't make you that girl, but it will make you that girl, if you know what I mean. And, and looking at a 10,000 foot level, that makes the kids in the sport more interesting. And in some ways you have villains and you have heroes, but that's fun. I mean, if you don't have conflict and everything, you just sit around and life is sunshine and rainbows. We need it. Where's the drama in that? And so sports is drama. We yeah. need it. We really do. We really need it. And I, so, and, um, so I, I want to I I take it to one more point. I want to take it one more place. Okay. <clears throat> Gold medal. Okay. USA. Does it matter? Um, I don't have my thoughts, but I'm, I'm interested to know what your thoughts are. Uh, we haven't got one in the last, I don't even know. I can't even remember the last time. We, when was it? Oh, geez. Japan won last time. Was it two or three Olympics ago? I'm horrible with history. But so um, we ha- we ha- bottom line is, we, I mean, we haven't gotten a gold medal. And in a while. Since, since uh, did Beijing, did we get one? Nope. I can't remember. I just remember Japan has passed this at least more recently. But does it matter? 
You're asking my, my opinion is it does. Okay. And here's why. We're not the best anymore. We can't take it for granted. Japan's good. China's good. Australia's good. You can get, and I'm sure you see this in athletes. You win all the time. You can get lazy and just sit on your laurels. You're not motivated. So I think the, the bad thing about the Olympics is, you know, it's four years apart. But as it starts to build up and the, and the national media starts or international media starts talking about stories, do you think that they're not going to say, well, the United States is second best? You know, we're not, we're not Japan. That's going to get a lot of people interested in, in like, what do we need to do to become the best again? It's going to fire people up. So, and I, yeah. And I think that the Olympics at least does get the international, certainly the national attention that the sport hasn't generally received. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's one thing to be the best in your state, best in the country, but to be the best in the world. And then we see these great, the Cat Ostermans who get to play on this, they're, they're role models. So, you know, a little girl hopefully watch Olympics and go, I want to be Cat Osterman someday. I want to do this. And it's not just, well, I have to be a track athlete or I have to, you know, be in a gymnastics. I could be a softball player and kick ass. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with that. And then, so, and, then we can, and then we need to tell those girls stories and make them human. Yeah, and that's they'll do and that. And, you know, the national media will talk about the Cat Osterman, so where she came from and what her trials have been. And, yes. you know. And that's where they become human. And that's yes. where the sport it became the Caitlin Clarks that the little girls can identify. Yes. So my, my job, I'm trying to tell stories that will affect people, impact them, make them angry. You know, I see you wearing a New York Yankees hat and it makes me angry. No, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I, 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 all I'm doing is being who I am. And, and everybody should be able to do that. Who is, yes. And that's why I wanted, I wanted to have you on a podcast. Who is Brent Eads? Really, some loser, some loser from Ohio. Who is he? This know. guy, and, and, and this is this is the perfect segue into what I want to talk about next. Who the heck is Brett Eads? He's over here one two months ago, and then he pops over over here. He's line drive media, and here's the reason why you can do that because you, as a person, Brent Eads, are the brand. Thank you. How, how you how you choose to to uh, show up? <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't <laughs> really matter how you show up because it's still you that's showing up. So please tell us a little bit, a little bit about Line Drive Media. What we can, what we can expect. Why, okay. if you want to get into that, I'd love to hear it. And then, and then, how do we, how do we get involved? How do we, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we get involved? Um, you bring up two good points. Line Drive Media is like the parent company, and, it, and we build it that way. So hopefully, someday we can do Line Drive softball, or we can do Line Drive anything, other sports, have other sports channel. Um, but the site is Line Drive Softball. Unfortunately, linedrivesoftball.com was taken. So if you want to go to it, you have to do linedrivemedia.com or linedrivesoftball.net. So the best way, I think, is linedrivesoftball.net. Linedrive Softball is the brand. And what am I doing? I'm trying to do the same thing that I've always done. Tell stories, honor the sport, and make the attention on the kids and the, the game. And, the, you know, why do people follow me or know me? For One, I've done this a while. Now, I think number two, I kind of started the rankings in the sport where, you know, oh my gosh, we're going to rank these little girls. Oh, how screw it. They're athletes. <laughs> and the other thing is, I think is I have passion for it. I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I love these kids. I love these coaches. And when I changed, I started extra softball and I recently started line drive softball. And when I, I, I left extra in January 15th. And I want to say we started line drive April 1st. So I had about a good month and a half to kind of just step back and think about what I wanted to do in the future, who, what I want to be when I grow up. And I cannot tell you, Rob, the touching impact it had. And I, and I say this more seriously than joking. It was almost like being at my own funeral because I got to enjoy people were coming to me and saying, thank you for what you've done. What are you doing next? How can we help you? Mm -hmm. And the outpouring of love and appreciation. I'm just trying to tell stories and, and, you know, have a job and be in media and do what I've done. But the impact from the audience, the market has, they've come to me and said, thank you for doing this has really, really been touching. And it makes me more fired up to go out and do more of what can give this sport the spotlight it deserves. So that's where I'm at now. So line drive softball.net and it's a subscription based thing. Uh, you have to pay the bills, have to pay the uh, internet bills, but um, 
I think we're, we're trying to get into everything and, and you know tell stories and do a lot. Our focus is a lot on high school and club, but we're going to do, like you said earlier, youth up to pro international. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have Carlos Arias working for me. Carlos is great. Yep. I've known him, you know, for 20 years probably. And we know him. We know him. He's, he's, he's family. He's part of family. He's family. He yep. worked at the Orange County Register and he's, you know, legit journalist. And we're going to get some more people, bring them in. Yep. But it's again, to expand the coverage, get bigger, tell more stories. And that's, that's what my goal is. Awesome. Um, I'm really, really uh, humbled that somebody of your magnitude would come on my little old podcast. <laughs> uh, you're, you're big in the sport too. People know you. But no, I really, I really, I really am appreciated, appreciative because I know you're busy. We're all, we're all busy, but just to take the time to, to kind of just tell who you are and then share it so people can say, oh, I, I didn't know Brent played, played the organ. I didn't know he was, I didn't know he was from the Midwest. I didn't know that he was, he was a Ohio, Ohio State Buckeye. Like people, well, you know, these are things. Now I like I like Ohio State, but I'm neutral. I have, and, and someone made a comment. Um, where, you know, I have to cover USA softball. I cover PGF. I cover Alliance. I cover U Triple S A. You, you're in this business. You have to be agnostic. You have to show love to everybody. And so I take pride in that. That I'm going to do a story on whoever it is, not based on their politics, so to speak. But um, what they're doing, and if they're doing it for good reason, and if it's an interesting story to tell. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm in a good space, and I love what I do. I love the people, obviously, the sport. So, All right, Brent. Brent, thanks for coming on the podcast. Anytime. Let's do this uh, every every week. Every <laughs> we could, Maybe every couple I, I do. I would love to bring you back, though. But that, that's, awesome. we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk yeah, about that. We'll, All right, let's talk, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks, bud. See you soon. Yeah.